That's true. Naked Palpatine. Um. <laughs> oh, oh, you pick that one. Fresh out of the clone tank, nude Palpatine. Is my That's the first thing I think of when you say Dark Empire Palpatine. and welcome back to the Star Wars Expanded Universe. Now we by Disney or can Lucasfilm, whichever way you slice it, Legends. Today we finish the Force Heretic Trilogy Book 3 Reunion by Shane, Sean Williams and Shane Dix. And this is Book 17 of the 19 book epics, so we're nearing the end, of the new Jedi Order series. Um, so, again, no chapters. It's, I don't like it. It, it, it. It's fine if you have a physical copy, you know, because you can still feel the progression, but still, I like being able to be like, chapter five, cool. I can stop reading, go about my day. But I, I don't I don't like that. But that's a really minor gripe here. Um, story wise, I still feel this is too bloated. Um, it just kind of drags in sections, man. This this didn't need to be a trilogy. And you know why this is more abundantly clear? Because book two, with everything on Bakora and everything that goes on there, it's hardly even mentioned. They go like, oh yeah, Bakora happened. Did it like super help the main plot? No, the little minor spurts of Oh, going to the, the Chiss homeworld and the stuff with Tahiri. That's stuff that matters for this book because it's furthering that plot line. But as for the big gist of that second book, which the main point was, hey, we're going back to Bakora, is that in any way in integral to the overall plot of this trilogy? No. The first and third book are. Because this feels more like a sequel to the third book, to the first book, than it does the second. It's because they dragged it out. Again, Cool to see Bakora again, but I'm going to stand by it. The second book was unnecessary. It's because, well, we have to fill out that runtime. We didn't need a trilogy. Especially not by these people. It's not bad. Uh, that, that sounds mean. But, like, Grey Keys, or... I guess he did get a trilogy of sorts. Uh, or... Uh, Salvatore. Matthew Stover again. Like, I don't know, anybody else... You know, James Lucino... I guess he did get a trilogy. Kathy tires even, man. Like, I don't know. Like, I just didn't feel all this. What's going on? So we got Pelion doing stuff again. We got Han and Leia and Droma and the Rin Network. And sometimes Jaina Jag and Tahiri. But then we mainly are focusing on Tahiri and her inner conflict. And then over on the other side of the world, we got... The whole Zomna Sakat plot, which is the most important for the plot of the overarching story of New Jedi Order, and everything going on with that, with Jason and Danny Kui and Saba Sabatine, who's amazing, by the way, you know, and then Luke and Mara and da 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 da. So, everybody's kind of fumbled around right now, being everywhere, and it's just kind of. It's fine. Like, the, the Han and Leia stuff is, to me, the most boring part of this book. Like, I, I could not care less. And then, of course, we have the best part, part of this entire trilogy, which I just have failed to mention because it's always just in little spurts, which is Naminor faking this entire religion, bringing up this entire heresy within the new, within the entire Yusong Vong structure in order to dismantle things. But then also, thing on Naminor, he doesn't really care. He just wants to get to the top. If that's actually dismantling the society, then he'll do it. But then he also realizes that I really can't. I don't have the means or the resources to overthrow anything. So I just need to get Shirma's attention, get him a little scared, and maybe at one point I could get back in his good graces somehow. But, you know, that's basically like his whole plot line. People are starting to portray him because, you know, he's not a true believer in the things he's saying. He's just saying stuff right now. He's just talking out of his butthole so that way people will listen and follow him. But people are like, we actually want to get out of oppression and you've yet to actually help us. We're just kind of sitting here, causing a ruckus so more of us die while you sit here and don't actually change anything. Kind of like politics. 
all oh, book bicker and fight during the terms. Nothing changes, not really, on the day to day. Maybe taxes increases or lowers, or gas prices rise or lower. But on the day to day, what changes for you? Um, but that that's basically how they're feeling. Like you're not actually making anything change. You gave us hope, and then you did nothing with that hope. Um, so the trust that people had on him are starting to diminish. And that's basically the, the different plots here. Um, Zumna Sakat's super interesting. It's especially more interesting now. I don't think Rogue Planet actually helped this much. It is a prequel era book, so you could read it in chronological order like I did. Like, I remember the gist of that plot. Or you could go back to the prequel era before finishing this trilogy and read Rogue Planet real quick and then read this and it'll be fresh in your mind. But you don't really need it. I know that's what Mega Reviews did. Um... But this, it's actually more interesting now because of, there's a lot of questions raised and not completely answered even by the end of the series, what Zumna Sakat is or how it came to be, um, and Supernatural Encounters by Joe Bongiorno actually helps um, flesh that out further, so um, definitely heavily recommend Supernatural Encounters if you haven't checked it out and you've read New Jedi Order and you've been interested about Zumna Sakat. And I think this is the main book, now that I'm rereading it, for why people are against me on my whole Jason view. Um, because, you know, he's very staunchly this one thing, um, and that's, that's what people, you know, kind of like, they, they hold on to, like, this specific book of Jason, I think, even though he's probably the most boring here, but, like, this is, this is the book that they hold on to, like, oh, the savior, oh my god, he can never be evil, oh my god, oh my god, this book, and that's it, you know, even though it's one of the most boring books of New Jedi Order. I'm sorry, I mean, the parts of it are anyway. Um, but I also hate him and Danny Quee, so that whole thing's not interesting. But there is an interesting thing to piss you all off that I'll talk about in spoilers at the very end, when the last conversation in this book that Jason has with the planet Zomna Sakat, because the planet is a living planet. But without spoilers, that's about the gist of it. You know, they finally find Zomna Sakat. They talk to the locals, who you would have known a bit about them if you read Rogue Planet, even though this is like Descendants and stuff now. But still, other than Japatha, who was in Rogue Planet. Um, but yeah, they, you know, they spend this whole time, like, talking to the people down there, and some of them are antagonistic, and then eventually Zomna Sakat decides to speak, and then it's, will Zomna Sakat help or not, and to end this conflict, you know? And that's, that's basically the gist of what's going on in this book. So, that's the main plot thread, and it'll be important... Especially for unifying force. Uh, but that's pretty much it for non-spoilers. If you don't want spoilers, time for you to go. Otherwise, stick around. I don't have too many notes, and I have work. I gotta get going. So, um... There's a fun scene in the beginning. Han plays Sabacc, and it's, it's, it's always fun. It, it feels very in line with this character. Um... So... Here's also the goddamn problem with all of you. This series, rereading it, is so inconsistent with characterization. As much as I love it, as much as it is the peak of storytelling, in my opinion, at least in the grand strokes, because now that I'm rereading it, a lot of it is not as amazing as I thought it was. The, gr the, the broad strokes, the overarching plot of the Yusong Vong invasion, Jason's capture, people dying left and right, a real genuine threat. That really had its momentum going until after Traitor. Like, it just needs to end already. Like, Matt says, oh, I could go another 20 books in this era. Maybe if we focused on different characters. But I just want it done at this point. It is too long. And you can feel them stretching things out because they're trying to get it to a certain length when it doesn't need to be. I'm sorry. But also, the inconsistency in character. Because, in Traitor, they literally specifically mention how Jason's good at manipulating, how he orchestrates things to get things where they are. Even if a bit of it's my interpretation, it's still clear that he wanted Ganner in a certain spot. And in Destiny's way, he specifically says in like his brain, like in his little thought mentions in the book, that he's gotten really good at manipulating people because of Regier, that he's learned from that, and he's really good at it now. They specifically say this. It's, it's, it's a sentence in the damn book. And here, in this book, it says that Jason's not a good liar. 
That doesn't fit. That's inconsistent. Jason has always been inconsistent. He may broadly, with the broad strokes of this book, be consistent with his overarching arc throughout the series, but then you have little things like this that just don't fit. It may be a little thing, but it just doesn't work if you've been paying attention. So, Jason started out as this loser kid that liked animals and made jokes. That's all of his character was. And now he's this big philosophical guy who doesn't want to fight. And then after Traitor, he's this guy that would prefer peace, but will do what is necessary if it comes down to it. But he would really, 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 really prefer to find an alternative solution. That's who he is in the broad strokes of things. That remains consistent, but the little details, the little things that would matter to make a case for anything are jumbled in between the entire story arc, depending on who's writing the damn book. So don't try to argue and tell me that this character was broad and perfect and had a perfect storyline start to finish, here to end, with his characterization, because it's kind of fumbly, and this is every single character, and Matt Wilkins has pointed this out, and as I read through it, I'm noticing it too. It is not consistent. So, you know, the difference, at least moving forward, you have one person writing it. What You have, you have three people writing it, so, the, so it's still going to be inconsistent, but it's going to be way less inconsistent than it is with a whole bunch of people. And the only reason you say this jack crap is because you want to be right. But if you actually look at it analytically, it don't work. So, all of Jason has always been inconsistent to the stuff that goes on down the line, to right now, everything has been inconsistent. There is no consistency to this character except to the whims of whoever wishes to direct his character. Thank you. <sighs> Naminor's religion has grown. I already talked about that. The big part of this book, which is one of my favorite parts of the book, is Tahiri overcoming her grief. Now, and, and finally uh, integrating that hybrid into one being. Because that's kind of a struggle she's having in her mind, and she talks to the Rena part of her, and they finally combine to become this new person, this one. Now, again, I don't mean to make this a whole defense of Denning stuff down the line, but, again, I love Tahiri. She's one of my favorite female characters in all fiction. I love her, and I love Tino Ka. I love them both more than Mara. And so, you know, yes, she gets over her grief and she becomes this hybrid, right? So she's this new person. She isn't even technically to hear anymore, even though she still calls herself that. She's a new being with the memories of the past. Kind of like Doctor Who, you know, a new person with the memories of the old. But again, people are like, well, she got past it in this book, right? Right? She's over it. So she can never get sad about it again. Have you, have you lost a person before? Do you know what it's like to love someone? Do you? Because I, I know in real life, like a person dies, goes in a grave, you, you mourn and then you, you move on because that's life. But imagine a universe where somebody could offer to bring back your dead grandma or your brother or your sister or, or whoever you've lost. Or even if they can't bring it back, we can take you back in time. You can, you can at least see them again. And maybe I can bring them back. That's not going to affect you? That's not going to maybe make you fall back? There's a thing called when people get into drugs and addiction and then they're trying to become sober and everything. There's things called, oh my god, relapses. Oh my god, scary word for you guys that try to argue against stuff. Oh my god. Wow. Crazy. I know. But yeah, that's the thing. So, yeah, Tahiri, for all intents and purposes, with the belief that Anakin's gone forever and there's nothing she can do, that she's willing to move forward. For now. Because she hasn't been tempted or been promised that she could potentially see Anakin again. Just remember that moving forward. But, yeah, so she gets over it and it's everything with her talking to Rena and trying to get over you know, this this whole conflict she's been having and become this new individual is really compelling and it's really interesting. And I, and I love Tahiri and the things she goes through in this trilogy. It is one of the redeeming aspects of this entire trilogy. Pelion being amazing, finding the Vong, remains an excellent part of the book. I always love Pelion. There's not a single author that's been able to fail to write Pelion. Even Kevin J. Anderson didn't ruin uh, Pelion because everybody just seems to get how to write him correctly. And I appreciate that. Lastly, you know, they talk to the planet, it finally decides it will join in the conflict, and then you have the ending, you know, or, you know, the epilogue or whatever, you know, and we'll get more of this in the book 18 and 19. 
But the one thing that stood out to me was the final conversation that Jason has with Zelmina Sakat. Because he, Luke says, you know, if it comes down to it, yes, I want you to join the war effort. I, I'm, if it comes between that and trillions of people, yeah, I'd choose that, you know. But it's a slippery slope. Did he make the wrong decision? And Jason's also struggling with the same question. But he says, no, I'm not willing to go that route. I'm not willing to have you become an asset of war. I want to find a peaceful solution. Right, because Jason's not a dark side character right now. I agree with all of you people. But here's, here's the thing. And he says he's going to ponder this. But remember, we have a war going on. So it's not like he gets to ponder it that much. I guarantee you, during that six-year gap, he's pondering it. Because Zomnus Kant mentions a price. Uh, Jason says, or she, he asks, what, what do you think I, Zamna Sakat goes, what do you think I crave? And then Jason lists off a couple things like peace, long life, you know, live long and prosper, you know. And then Zamna Sakat mentions, yeah, but what if someone threatens that? Do I have the right to do this or that, you know? And, you know, but having that peace, having that tranquility, having that happiness comes at a price. Are you willing to pay that price? Now, that could be about sacrificing himself, like, in, as in dying. I do think it has something to do with sacrifice, whether it's about him dying at the end of Unifying Force, it's like a red herring that he might die at the end of the series, even though he doesn't. Or whether that be something more insidious, as he ponders in his six-year gap in between series. What price are you willing to pay? He has to ponder that. Again, it's a little thing. None of this book shows in any way, shape, or form that Jason's going dark. I agree with you. But that is something to ponder when they say that at the end. Overall, the book is fine. I find a lot of it boring. I, I, I just, the, the writing style, I don't know what it is. The fact that it's like 390 pages, this story didn't need to be that long. It was cool to see drama again. The Teary stuff was great. Pallium was great. The Han and Leia stuff was kind of boring. The Jag and Jaina stuff was also, you know, it was alright. I don't it just it just isn't the greatest thing since sliced bread. It is it's kind of a, it, it, it's boring at times. Like there's gems within the rough that you have to find, but you have to get through a lot of slog too. Like I it, it's just not my favorite thing, and I hate that they got to write three books in here. It just felt unnecessary. But overall it's done, it's over, we can move past it. Um next we have the final prophecy. By Great Keys, and then we finish this entire long story arc with Unifying Force by James Lucino. Until next time, guys, may the Force be with you.